ITC Europe, going to be in Barcelona. You're going to do a demo. What's the demo? Yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I've got a small slot. Um, I think we've got a booth as well. So if anybody that's listening is there, come come check in and say hi. Um, we, we're doing demo on stage and demos at the booth. Um, and I'm going to give the crowd a quick overview of um, of what it takes to launch a product on our platform. Um, I go from zero to one in a handful of minutes. No kidding. Okay, now, we should have started with that, this episode. So how long does it take to launch a new insurance product with you? Um, tech, Technology-wise, it could be very fast. We've got templates, and then, like I said, you can get a template up and running in a handful of minutes. Um, then there's customization, there's your branding, and maybe changing the pricing and stuff. And then there's um, getting all of that in place. I think the fastest we've launched the product was maybe sub two weeks. Um, sub two weeks. So, yeah, and then what, what we found is technology is now not the barrier anymore. It's now compliance, uh, policy wording, those mm-hmm. things that... Um, so, so the ball's been thrown over the fence again, back to the, the other side. The bottleneck has shifted. So if an insurance company or an MGA is ready, they have the wording, they have everything, they have a beautiful Excel sheet with all the if this, then that... You can basically launch a new product. Oh, sorry. And the, all the graphic assets and the copyrights. Yeah. You can launch that product in a few minutes or make it ready up to the approval of the regulators. And then it can go live in a few minutes. Yes. So Amazing. Yeah, it's pretty much that. It's, it's, it's a matter of um, just configuring it, setting it up. And if you're starting from a template that already exists, it literally is is a few minutes. Um, Let's say hours, because you sit there tweaking stuff to get it perfect. Of course, of course. Oh, yes, that's the Saturn V rocket. Um, So I'm quite a big fan of, I guess, space and Lego. Any (laughs) combination of two of those things. Um, But then also, it's just the easy way out for my partner to buy gifts. It's all the Lego. Oh, yes. I, I... Man, that's such a brilliant idea. Once you have some sort of a hobby, which is very straightforward, it's like, and that's going to be the next gift. Oh my God. I wish my wife had something like that. That would make my life such easier because jewelry, it's not a hobby. Shoes and bags are not a really hobby. And I can always mess that up. Hmm. But yeah, no, yeah. that's, that's, no, that's I, a pretty good point. Pain. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I appreciate. So are you just about building models like the Southern behind you or more on the technical ones that move and you can tweak them mm-hmm. and stuff like that? So I'm, I'm actually more when it comes to, um, so my hobby is more on, I guess, on the electronics side of things. So building stuff mm-hmm. with electronics um, and like you can actually, I think also see in the background, there's a, there's a Delta wing um, standing there. It's a bit difficult to see in the video. Um, But I've been building drones, racing drones and stuff for a long while. um, And pretty much anything else that I can hack together and solder together and and get working. It's kind of of nice to build things, like real physical things. um, Because my kind of profession is software engineering where everything is virtual. It's on a computer screen. Um, Yeah, so I really, really like making things real. So when you're talking about drones, because I couldn't see the Delta, Delta Wing, you're talking about drones, drones, not the, the modern drones with the four altars. The yes, ones I'm, that I'm we talking... used to run, the, the ones that we used to run, the small planes that we used to run in one of the backyard fields kind of thing. Empty, no, I actually, empty lots. actually never never got to those. I, I had one before, oh. but it, uh, I think I crashed it early on and it didn't work. Um, but now I'm on, I'm on drones, like the four rotor um, Mm. multi multi prop drones and normally like this quite small but bigger than a book maybe um and then you get it out with a camera and you put on the goggles and you can go race around um oh you're one and, of and those just do, not not professional i had a friend that got me into drones that was actually representing the country and that was quite an interesting observation um those are the guys that race in this in the like parking lots and all of those places um mm-hmm. I'm more just in trying to build the thing and get it in the air, mess around with it, crash it, rebuild it, <laughs> keep on going. Q 
can you tell our audience a quick introduction about what do you guys do and how did you get into insurance? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll give a quick, quick overview. So I'm from a company called Root. It's rootplatform.com. And um, what we essentially do is we, we try and, we're building a platform, a cloud-based platform, and trying to make it the easiest way for companies to launch um, modern digital insurance, whether it's embedded through partner channels or just um, through their own channels. And it's a low-code platform. And we've been, um, to kind of take it back to where we started or why we started, my background, I'm a software engineer. Um, and I've been mm-hmm. building stuff since school days. I had apps on the App Store that made pocket money on the side. And I've always been building things and solving problems with code. Um, and when, after my previous company that was that I was building in the States, I tried to figure out like, what is the next important thing to focus on? And, and I kind of got to the intersection of financial services, which is a very complex regulated industry. Um, and also the also software developers, other people who build things. And we tried to figure out how can we make it easier for people to build things to build stuff in financial services that zoomed in into insurance over time mm-hmm. and essentially guided us towards building the building blocks or yeah, literally like Lego blocks for insurance to kind of from a bottoms up first principles approach, we try to re- rethink or truly understand what makes insurance or what are the bottlenecks? Why are people stuck? Why is insurance not moving forward? And can we make that easier? Um, and that brought us, I mean, we've been running for seven years or so now into today, um, where we're a cloud-based platform that, that we service quite a lot of clients at quite a big scale, um, just helping them launch new products and do cool digital stuff, which is quite fun. Yeah, we, we started in Cape Town, South Africa. It's just our hometown, so it's a bit easier to get going. Contacts and networks and stuff exist um, and talent to pull pull people in. Um, and then we, we built in South Africa to t- kind of test the concept and test the model, experiment with it. And it, since it's been working quite well, we now recently, about a, six months ago st- six months ago or so, started pushing into the UK market as well. Um, so we're quite, if I can call it new or fresh in that market. And we, it's surprising how much is similar. Like people are, they've got the same issues. They're trying to solve the same problems. Um, but the UK market is much bigger and more mature and more kind of, uh, they've been th- through it all already. So they kind of know what they're looking for and, and it's quite a good fit there. Um, but yeah, currently I'm sitting in Cape Town and I'm in London again in a few weeks again. So back well, and forth the whole time commuting these days. If we're not, if we're not going to meet in person in London, we may meet each other in Barcelona for ITC and we'll talk about what you're going to present there and talk about, but before we jump there, so Cape Town, I've been to Johannesburg and other locations in South Africa. We we don't see, I think that from South Africa, we've seen the Vitality program. Um, I met another startup, I think it was Policy Doc. Most likely I miss, I'm confusing a couple of policy and something else. And there was a guy that Elon Musk was sort of a familiar some, person. Some people know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some people know, and he also plays with rockets. How's the insurance scene in South Africa, and how is it, you know, connected to the rest of Africa? Yeah, I can also add how's it connected to maybe the, like, more Western or like a UK industry, for example. So Mm -hmm. in South Africa, it's quite a mature... um, market it's the regulations and stuff is pretty much it's very similar to the uk um environment in that sense the same like treat your customers fairly and all of those type of twin peaks models are are at play in south africa what we have found though is it's quite a bit more it's broader so you have less specialists in the country in terms of insurers in terms of uh, tech providers in terms of any other type of like services or or people in the industry, whereas in the UK, you might have a pet insurer that's massive. In South Africa, you'd have an insurer that also sells pet insurance as a second or third product. Um, So at first in South Africa, we got a bit worried that we went too broad. We, our platform that we've been building here was quite, um, it it serviced pretty much any product. It's product agnostic. We run everything from life insurance to device insurance and motor insurance. And when we went to the UK, we learned because it's so much more focused and niche. Um, everybody in that space 
just focuses on their niche. So they don't actually have a way to kind of breach the barriers to any of the other products or any of the other channels they want to do. And that actually set us up quite well for for that market. Um, so kind of like South Africa being very generalist and then most other established countries or, or markets rather being much more like vertically focused and, and like niche focused. Compared to Africa generally, South Africa's got a much, much larger insurance penetration than the rest of Africa. I think we're sitting on, I think it's like 17%, which I think is like GWP over GDP or so, um, versus the rest of Africa is on something like 2% on average. So Africa as a whole doesn't really know insurance. Nobody's got cover. It's not a thing. It's got some basic covers in place. South Africa mm-hmm. is heavily insured. Um, and well, yeah, that's, also, that's pretty we, much the thing. Need- so, so I would say... We also need to. Yeah, sorry, go you ahead. Now, now, beside the fact that in the continent, well, South Africa is a country. The rest of Africa yes. is a continent with very, with many, many different countries, and usually we'll cut it into West Africa, East Africa, Northern Africa, or the Northern Sahara, which those are completely more of uh, the Arab countries, and in the South. Maybe Nigeria, especially in the more established cities like Lagos, Abuja, and a few others, you will have more penetration of insurance. But needless to say that in the rural areas, I assume that uh, you don't really know even how much the population is. Um, yeah, and I've got a, a big challenge. I've started, I've started thinking about it almost the same as like Maslow's triangle, like the hierarchies there, mm-hmm. um, in terms of financial services and. In Africa, a lot of the foundational infrastructure doesn't exist properly. So your payments and, and normal money movement is not a solved problem. Um, so you see a lot of payment companies these days, startups trying to operate and do that. And you have to solve payments and moving money before you can start introducing credit, before you can start introducing loans, or it's credit, um, investment stuff, and then insurance as well. So to solve insurance in African market is a very hard thing because you're, you're trying to solve multiple problems. Um, versus if you go to let's say the uk where payments like everybody has a card everybody uses like um tap and go or what whatever um cardless payments these days cards in africa is not even a thing um in most places so you, you can't just rely on those type of infrastructure um and that makes the problem just like orders of magnitude more complex interesting i think that they were, they had a certain frog leap in terms of technology especially in the payments that everything went through the mobile what we struggled for many years in especially in the u.s because of the different structure and the cost of improving from legacy systems and infrastructure was jumping to mobile you had an old cell phone no problems new cell phone even better it's like actually the old cell phones worked better on that just text you pass the money And that was their payment uh, structure. Of course, there were other ways as well, but it it was very interesting to to follow on that element. And from here, to create what you said, you know, all those uh, buildings, to bring the building blocks and make sure that they are there so you can actually establish that pyramid that you'll have the insurance. There is still work, yeah. Yeah, I still lot. remember in the States paying my rent mm-hmm. by check and I didn't know how the hell do I get my hands on a check. And the landlord had to coach me on how to go get a check from the ATM. And in South Africa, you would just do a normal transfer. Money will land mm-hmm. in a day or two and you'll go on. Um, so, yes, I think South Africa, or many other countries are much more advanced when it comes to payments and, and stuff. Than, well, um, there is a lot of... Kind of yeah, well, if we are going there, I'll share my story. So I moved to the US in 2009, New York, New York back then. Mm. It wasn't as happening as now, though. There will be a lot of New Yorkers that will have different opinions about the few last mails. I still think that Bloomberg was one of the better ones. But that's my opinion. Um, so 2009, you try to get it, you try to deposit a check. You, it's impossible. So you can do that through the ATM, but you need to go into the branch, get a, a three-copy sp- slip, so it will have the white, the yellow, and the pink, and use that to transact with the ATM. Now, at that point, so coming from Israel, we already 
is it deposit the check the atm reads it and give you a receipt with you know a xerox of or a copy printed copy of the check that you deposit and what's the right and you also need to type the uh, what's the amount today we can actually do it from our cell phone and take a picture from you know the iphone app or whatever that may be So what are the API services that you provide? Yeah, so I think that's a good good segue. So APIs, like essentially building blocks in our world is, is APIs to a large extent. There's some other build pieces around it. Um, and what we focus a lot on, so we've got, okay, maybe for broader context, where what Root is um, as a product, it's, it's ultimately a, a cloud-based policy administration system. It's got everything from you know, quoting and binding, policy admin, payment collections, claims, all the stuff you'd expect to, to be able to run an insurance business. Um, and then from an API point of view, we've got APIs for all of those functions. And APIs are essentially the mechanism that systems talk to each other. You can think of it as like a telephone line or something. A system can send an instruction to, let's say, root system to get a quote that needs to pass the right fields. And root will then, depending on the product, calculate a premium and some other data and pass it back to that system. Now. What many companies do, especially in insurance, they've got APIs, they retrofit APIs onto, call it legacy systems or systems that weren't built for for this type of integration. Um, and you sit with two problems. One is you sit with stuff that's not real time. An example of that would be where it takes upwards of like 30 seconds to get a quote. Now, that's normal in the industry. It's scary. Um, if you imagine you're on Facebook and you want to like see your feed and it takes 30 seconds to load the feed or you want to post on Twitter and it takes again 30 seconds to, to post that tweet. That's that's like you you would it won't work. Um and that's just how insurance is. If you try and get a quote, it takes forever. So that's the first problem. And that's just because those systems aren't geared for real time cloud based type of operations. And the second one is um the APIs are very limited and very not geared for developers that actually need to consume them. And this is where we focus a lot is we focus on the developer experience. Um and making it easy for people that need to consume it. And it's almost like if you think of Lego blocks, okay, Lego is maybe a bad example because if you get the blocks, you can just build something and be creative. Um, you don't really need the manual. But in insurance, that doesn't work. You can't you can't have basically tools that people don't understand that's not user-friendly for the people that need to consume the tools. Um, so APIs for me is actually a lot more than just the individual actual endpoints that a system makes available. It's about all the guides and tutorials and documentation and and even community around consuming that. Um, if you want to think of a like a good example of or that we kind of um, get inspired by is a company like Stripe in the payment mm -hmm. side again. Um, not to digress, but they they focus a lot on creating an excellent developer experience, and that's what we try and do in insurance. Is going somewhere in that business, you've got a commercial director or a, some insurance head who wants to launch a new product, and they don't understand tech, and they don't actually understand that there's multiple parties involved, multiple people product teams, software developers that need to consume that into their app or into their website or into, if it's embedded in trends, into a partner's channel. And those developers need to understand Ooh. what they do, what they're doing, what they're working with. Um, and that that's what make APIs, that sets APIs apart, I would say, or takes it from being useful Lego blocks to just being wooden blocks that doesn't fit together. Okay, we have a couple of topics that, that we can touch on. So let's start with the basics. So are you a tech platform? Are you considering yourself as a core system, something like um, Socotra and Guidewire or more on the product quoting? Where, where do you find yourself in the ecosystem? Def definitely core systems. I think Socotra is maybe a good um, good example of Guidewire, Duck Creek. Obviously not that, not no, no, that no. Uh, incumbent, if I can call it that. Well, um, yeah, now they, we can consider Guidewire as the the new legacy yeah, yeah. I mean, if you just go if you go purely on age i think you can safely yeah. safely do that um yeah i'd say so if you're launching a new product um you need the quoting side of it which is a key part of selling a policy it's generating a quote for the customer um but then you need the rest of the system that also works and you need apis for that as well you need to be able to make adjustments or, or alterations to it. You need to be able to renew policies, um, act on or like send billing instructions, act on failed collections, you know, like execute retention strategies, um, 
send communications to customers. So it's, so it's quite comprehensive. Um, and Unroot definitely falls in the core system category. Um, it can run next to others in parallel mm-hmm. to get, uh, often our clients do that. They maybe already have Guidewire as a core system. They paid boatloads of money for it. And then when they want to launch a product, it costs boatloads of money to launch another product. So then they work with us in parallel to Guidewire um, to, to gain speed and to actually get to market fast. So when we... <clears throat> Sorry for that. When we go on your website, we see logos of many customers. I assume many happy customers, uh, familiar brands like Travelers and others. What is the problem that you're solving them? What is the solution? Why? And if you can actually provide, no need to name names. Hopefully you can. Um, what is a use case that you're solving for them? I know that you already gave sort of an example in high level, but you know, a good use case, concrete one will be even better. Okay, so um, I think the the primary thing we're solving for companies is helping them launch new digital products. So we don't really focus on the broker intermediated to where there's humans in the loop. Mm -hmm. Um, So we focus on digital. And what we help them do is get those products to market, um, especially when they want to sell it through partner channels. So if you can think of Hmm. embedded or white label insurance, that's where we play most of the time. Most of our clients are in that category. And that's essentially you have three parties in the loop. You've got the, the carrier, the insurer, or sometimes that's an MGA, but you've got someone who controls the product and the underwriting. And then the second party would be the, um, the brand, the platform, and the, or the kind of customer-facing brand. That would be a retailer, um, a telco. It could be a bank for bank assurance or, or a digital platform. We've got some of those as well. Um, and they want to actually sell insurance to their customers. So the carrier wants to leverage the distribution that exists or that's created by this other big brand that maybe already sits on a million customers that buys T-shirts from them or, or whatever they sell. Um, and we, we not only do, do those products run on our platform, so they get built and configured and, and the whole policy runs on route. Not only that, we also help them bridge the communication between the carrier and those brands because you've got a, an insurer that's typically very actuarial heavy focuses on pricing and risk. And then you've got a brand that doesn't know anything about insurance that focuses on the customer and the customer experience. And those two things, you need to balance it because they're often like working against each other. The brand wants to ask zero to or just a few questions. The insurer wants to ask more questions for the customer so they can price it better. And obviously as a trade-off and and we, we kind of bridge that. We facilitate a lot of those meetings. We um, coach both sides on it and, and ultimately when the products get built the actuaries can work on route build their products <laughs> and then the non-insurance developers and product teams on the other side can consume those products without having to know anything about insurance so that's kind of the big thing we solve that getting the products to market in that way part of what they do is to explain mainly to other executive in the industry something that they don't see most when we're talking with executives insurance executive if it's their own it the technology the business side they don't see what's going on on the startup sometimes they're using the big company small company strategy in terms of oh they're going to do the work for me for most of them even if they are very proactive in trying to push things out the door there are challenges, so they will go to something that is convenient and very service-oriented, I would say. Um, but they don't know what's the the effort and the very bad ROI, very low ROI, that it comes for that startup. And what does it mean for the future of the company? Or yeah, let's call it the mental health of the founder. Really depends on which stage, right? <laughs> if you are a, a Series A, you'll have enough account managers and people to run around to make that happen. But before, while you're at Seed, you are almost everything. You and a bunch of, most like four or mm. five people that help you to, to make magic. Yeah. No, this is brilliant. Love it. So when it comes to your customers, how do you help them? And again, a brilliant segue with the build by rent question that they will always have. Yes. You've added a third one. We always work with build versus buy. Um, 
I kind of I, well, I always think rent about the will be leasing, that's right. Paying for the license. But you put yes, yes. No, I, that makes sense. I normally think about it as like what is the problem you're trying to solve and what do you have what is your leverage? And my view on it is the the insurer or maybe the channel that they this brand that they sell the products through or embed the products into their speciality is the actual risk it's pricing it's underwriting um it's all the back office stuff that comes with that um it's maybe the brand they've got in the market but they are an insurance company not a tech company um so i would my my general recommendation is if you focus on the problem which is to launch a product that's relevant for customers to be able to iterate on it super quickly when you get feedback that you don't have the right product in the market um then building tech is maybe not the best thing to do um it also happens to be that um, insurers like we we find insurance to be uh, insurance to be heterogeneous so it's always different like you could have two products that look very similar but they're going to be different um and that's kind of a foundation that roots built on but that also means that companies insurance companies they build tech they they end up building very strange products and, and tech that fits the products and that kind of locks them in and that locks them into mm. inevitable like continuous uh, product development uh, not sorry not product development engineering software development um so our view is you, you kind of need to find the middle way and get the re- the right tech like the right core platform to run on so that you can spend your software engineering like efforts and focus and resources on the small part that sets you apart which is your anything that's customer facing would that be your app if you've got a website if you've got if you integrate into another partner and and both that own that be very good at that um but don't reinvent the wheel when it comes to core systems don't like there's enough companies that can generate the pdf policy document like you don't have to go build that yourself um and then maintain it and keep keep the lights on on that forever um so yeah so we're somewhere in the middle i would say you need to build the stuff that matters and then rent or buy if you can call it that the the rest yeah i just i just realized that w- the difference between when i use build by rent uh, the build do it yourself buy is acquisition by a company uh, and a rent license the software so i can yeah. understand where for you it will be only build versus buy so buy rent. a service or build the service yourself yes and then we can add the acquisition at a, a later stage for talent or technology or whatever they need mm. because when you look at the insurance industry most of them acquire it go by mergers and acquisitions it's very hard to build an insurance company out from scratch another insurance company that has the same name as you your company which I'm sure that our confusions from time to time especially in the states yep um so that's great that you have root platform and not just root because that can be a little bit confusing and did you have any copyright challenges with that um not so much so so root insurance the the motor insurance company in the states um they've got all their trademarks and stuff in the states and then mm-hmm. We've got we've got root trademarks in South Africa and I think in the UK I can't remember. No, oh, you need to we have. Check yeah, we, out. we've not we've not run into issues on that front. We've run into issues of investors, especially venture capital investors, and they go, they they ask like, oh, what's the difference and stuff. Um, but funny enough, in the UK and Europe, nobody, it, it hasn't come up. It's not a thing. Nobody knows or cares much about what goes on in the US, and so we're <laughs> still fine for now. <laughs> We're gonna we're gonna have to solve that in a in, in not too long from now. Yes, the whole yes. branding issue. Start thinking about that because it can. I can see how it's a challenge. Yeah, we've got an oh. ideas board running that we're tracking for what what can we call ourselves when we really need to change our name. Mm-hmm. We're trying to hold off on it. Lo. Because we are reaching the end of our episode, let me ask you the same question that I'm asking everyone. If, what would be the advice that you will give yourself at the beginning of this journey? That's a very good question. I, th- I thought about it a bit um, and I tried to focus it on the journey of building Root, not so much my, my whole life journey. 
I think the the one thing that I would tell myself, and I don't know if I would listen, because I have been told this by many advisors, and I did not listen, and then yet I still made the the same mistake, if I call it that, is that insurance is a very broad heterogeneous industry. So apples doesn't not match do not match apples, um, and therefore like stay hyper focused, um, keep it narrow, and and kind of don't don't get distracted by other big shiny things and we the reason i'm saying this is we've learned the lesson where we have we've learned the lesson where we where we have um where we think two clients are equal equally good because they're they're big they're going to pay us a lot of money but we only mostly deal with enterprise clients just to add that and but then they're actually completely different beasts very different animals they have different driving factors and stuff um, so that over time taught us to focus more on companies that have like the same traits, the same goal functions, the same type of personas driving the business because um, their way of thinking, their way of problem solving are the same. And that allows you to build a better product, more focused product, and then obviously create a much better customer experience. I love it. It's, you know, I, I don't know if it's, is this your first startup, second startup? Uh, it's my second like official one. So but the other one was much different. This is much more product focused. Yeah. So there is a part that, you know, at the beginning, and it's something that picked up early 2000s, the personas or know your customer. And if you're not dealing with SaaS or enterprise and you think about the different users, not customers, the users, you draw mm -hmm. this like 20 different personas and how are we going to approach this guy? But it's so true. At the end of the day, you, especially when it comes to enterprise, you want to narrow it down to one user that you know, one customer that you know very, very, very well and sell to them. And it's such a hard thing to do, especially when you go like, oh my God, there is so many. And by the way, if, when I see a deck that has, it's like, hey, the insurance in the industry is six or seven trillion dollars. Go like, okay, I don't care about this. <laughs> it's massive. And, and you're just throwing big numbers that has nothing to do with what you're mm -hmm. actually go, doing. Go try and slice that six trillion dollars into what it actually is. And mm -hmm. then you're going to get to come to many, many small, smaller segments. So my, my tip for the day, um, and that's something that I repeat to my customers, all I want to do, all I want to say is, and that's what we are working with them, is like, you want money. How is that going to take you from point A to point B? And how much money are you going to make at point B? I, we don't care about the six trillion or the hundred billion. We like it. Big numbers, but irrelevant for what you're doing today. Mm. It's good to know more or less the size of the ocean, but it's not blue ocean. There aren't it's so hard to find a blue ocean nowadays. You can dig one, but that's a different conversation for a different podcast. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Cool. Lo, thank you. Thank you very much for joining me today and spending almost 40 minutes talking about your company or plans for, um, for DIA in uh, Barcelona. Uh, how should people reach out to you? Sure. I think the easiest is they can um, uh, like email me. It's low, L-O-U-W at rootplatform.com. Uh, you can also just on our website reach out um, or Twitter. Um, and yeah, so if anybody's keen on learning more about embedded insurance or actually just getting our view on how it could work in your business, happy to chat and help where we can. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time today. It was a pleasure hosting you. Thank you, Gillette.